Hello, everyone. There you are over there. Right? Oh, no, I'm going to get wrecked. Oh, no, I just can't do that one. No, it's not too politically correct. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, welcome back to uh, the RationalInvestor.com's uh, Brother Chicken Show, uh, the craziest uh, hour, two hours of the of your life. Something like that. <laughs> Got to have some sort of tagline. I'm not even quite sure what our tagline is. Uh, we're the coolest. No, not really. <laughs> not really that cool. In fact, I would uh, probably be considered quite nerdy. In fact, we used to have a German lady on the site who used to call us nerds right to our faces. Like, yeah, thanks, lady. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, crazy uh, environment, uh, crazy market. Crazy world, crazy life. Are y'all enjoying the Great Reset? Uh, I hope you're enjoying it. I'm sure uh, Klaus is sitting there snickering to himself about well, what a wonderful con job he's pulling on the world and all of his World Economic Forum buddies. I even heard recently that the World Economic Forum now is coming out with a cryptocurrency. I couldn't believe that when I saw that the other day. And add insult to injury, I saw social media uh, people were like totally touting it. Oh, you got to buy this thing. It's like, ah, oh, this is like literally everything anti what it is, why we got involved in crypto to begin with. Ah, oh, crazy. So, uh, yeah, uh, the C CBDs? What's CBDs? I thought that was like something to do with cannabis. C That's CBD. That Are you thinking of CBDC? Is that what that is? Well, I don't like CBDs, right? Andre's always going on. Remember when we were in uh, Portugal, always uh, like going CBD, CBD. What, what was CBD that? CBD shops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the, the legal uh, cannabis that they have over there in Portugal. And I think it, Italy as well. Some some of your favorite called CBD, 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 and then THC. Anyway, is, yep, yep. so uh, how ironic! Uh, digital currencies to take over the world. One one digital currency to rule them all, uh, kind of thing. Seeing lots of lots of uh, lots of kind of talk like that on social media these days, which is a little disappointing, I suppose. Um, you know, get get ready for the twenty first century. I suppose we're you know we're pretty far away into this twenty first century. Probably, you know, if you think about it historically, like you think about what the latter part of the 20th century looked like, think about like the flappers and stuff like that, how they made such a dramatic change to society, right? And like at the very beginning of the century it was all the Victorians and their big dresses and their hats and their umbrellas and all that from a bygone era. And the flappers sort of, you know, initiated that sort of new look uh of society and then of course uh you know into the second half of the uh century um how pretty much you know i guess the flapper kind of look was sort of dominant through uh through a big chunk of that latter part of the century so whatever it is whatever the look is that's coming out the other side of uh this decade i think uh will dominate the rest of this this century wouldn't surprise me in fact, I think if you make the historical comparison, um, I think this is more like, you know, the 30s and 40s. And actually, you know, you know, uh, Red and Woods, great reset of that particular generation, the hyperinflation of the 1940s, following sort of the, uh, the, the banks taking over the system uh, and creating this Federal Reserve system, which is just basically a license for the banksters to print money. Um, so anyway, only history will, uh, will tell, uh, we're individual, uh, individual, what's the word I'm looking for? We're in between school terms right now. So, uh, these Sunday shows typically are supposed to be to just sort of, uh, help address, uh, student questions, uh, through terms. Everybody, of course, is feverishly writing exams. Um, and hopefully we see uh, level oneers move on to level two, level twoers move on to level three. And actually this term as a special treat, uh, Zach um, really took the initiative on his own and I'm so proud of him for this. Um, I've sort of been cajoling him and helping him along. Um, a lot of the, uh, the, the advanced uh, students and who end up, you know, going on to become instructors and things like that on the, on the, on the site um, 
uh, he's actually taken a lot of the options concepts uh, to the sort of the next level. Um, and uh, he's taken the initiative to sort of put together a spreads trading um, um, educational program that's uh, about half of the con course content material. But because options are so intense uh, and there's such a steep learning curve, uh, we've sort of stretched it out. So half of the modules, but done still over the 12 week period. Uh, everything from iron condors, if you know what the hell that is, to uh, debit, credit, spreads, um, calendar spreads, the whole darn thing. So I'm so proud of Zach. He's done a really, really good job putting the material together. And that, of course, is available to uh, TRI site alumni. We're doing the pilot project this summer just to see how it goes. We have sort of a select uh, group of people. Uh, those people that, uh, if you are watching this video later on, if uh, those people that did send a, a note saying that you would like to participate, we'll probably be sending out the invites this week. Um, and uh, this should be a, a really fun summer. If anything, what I really want to do is uh, be Zach's TA uh, and sort of help him along as he's uh, teaching the course. So you get a bit of a, a dose of the Beamish as well while we're at it. Um so uh, we already have, what's great about that was we had so much interest from the site that we've already booked up the seats that we would like to do for this pilot project. So they're all ready to go. Uh, if you are watching this after the fact and you are interested in learning how to spread trades uh, in earnest um, using uh, the options uh, markets, and actually even um, uh, Zach even wants to spread trade the, that BITO ETF uh, that I've used and the algo signals that the system has generated that you see on the screen here. And oh, by the way, uh, algo right now, uh, very, very negative right now. I don't see we're going to get any buy signals anytime soon on this. This is going to take some time to uh, really clean up. We just got sell signals in the stock market now. So uh, there is one gentleman on the site, I won't name names, but uh, he uh, said in the past what he really likes to do is only take trades when all three of these are all pointing the same direction. So I hate to say it, but I actually think we had a pretty good looking little sell signal up there on Bitcoin about a week or so ago. So, uh, but the point is, is Zach actually wants to do also an option spread trade program using the algo signals. And already right now, he is using things like, I uh, uh, haven't seen anywhere else on the internet uh, anybody do this. Um, in fact, it's quite unique. Unique. In fact, you know, I don't see anybody anywhere talking about uh, this concept called key reversals. Uh, so it's very unique to TRI. Um, and, um, and he also incorporates this into his spread trading along with seasonality. Uh, and uh, and things like sector rotation, which are concepts that we delve into in great detail in the level three. So super excited uh, for Zach to be uh, launching that program. Um, I think it's a great complementary program to our education program. Sort of consider it the icing on the cake. And if you are a TRI alum, um, uh, you, uh, you would have exclusive uh, access to that content. And if you are interested and you're watching this, uh, we'll, we're starting to take reservations for the fall and winter programs. Uh, we want to keep the seats relatively limited so Zach isn't overwhelmed. Um, so, you know, reach out and let us know. And we'll be sending letters to alumni um, of the program, letting know that, them know that this is available. So super excited for that. Um, and I have to say... Uh, I'm actually quite pleased at uh, what I'm seeing out of the market. It's it's pretty, I'd say, sort of business as usual. Um, unfortunately, uh, markets can't always go straight up. We all know that. Uh, sometimes they go up. Sometimes they go down. Sometimes they go sideways. Um, and if anything, you know, we all know what time of year it is. Uh, this is a great time for Liam and I because we get to go drive back up in the mountains again. In the mountain, in the winter time, I don't like driving in the mountains and the ridiculous snow up there. So uh, that's kind of a good uh, note. But unfortunately, when it comes to things like uh, investing and uh, playing in the market, uh, this uh, sort of late winter, early, uh, well, I wouldn't say early spring, mid spring, probably middle of spring, is a dangerous time in the market. Uh, 
if you've got your trading journals out and you are feverishly taking notes, which I think you really should be, um, I sit here and I blab away for a good couple hours and every once in a while something will spit out that you've probably never heard before. And you just want to hit the pause button and just go, geez, I got to write that down. Um, you know, I know one gentleman in particular, I don't know whether he watches these videos anymore or not, but uh, he literally taught himself <laughs> everything that I've done in like 30 years working in the market, just watching a couple of years of, uh, of these videos and feverishly taking notes. So um, the point I was just going to make is that uh, as a, a seasonal player of the market, this is uh, often the, the time of year where the professionals are sort of paying themselves for their all their hard work through the winter months. Uh, and uh, they will be basically ringing the register on any kind of strength uh, in whatever asset it is that they were promoting uh, and bidding up through the uh, winter uh, and uh, getting ready to pay for summer vacation homes in the Hamptons. If you don't know where the Hamptons are, uh, that'll give you an idea. Uh, Google that and uh, you'll know uh, what crowd I'm talking about. Uh, actually, uh, Chris, you're, you're up in that neck of the woods. You ever? You should probably take a road trip while you're still here in North America. And uh, just take a trip up to the Hamptons one uh, one weekend, just, just to say that you, you've been there. Sounds like a plan. I like that idea. I have not. Not a bad there, idea, so. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially like we have a few people on the East Coast there. I think you said you were running into other TRIers, weren't you? In uh, in that area. I mean, New I Jersey. Stevens that's not very far away from uh, from the Hamptons. Yeah, somewhere in New York. I don't know exactly where on the map that is, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's relatively drivable distance close. Yeah, it should be just up the other side of Long Island, right? Up in that direction, Martha's Vineyard and all that. Ah, uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Anyway, so the point is, is that uh, this is typically the time of year when Wall Street rings the register. It's just it's just what they do. Uh, and then, you know, they go and spend the summer in the Hamptons. And and actually, actually, there's a funny movie, uh, Weekend at Bernie's. Did you ever watch Weekend at Bernie's, Chris? Anyway, Chris is over there. So whenever you see me looking over there, it's because I'm looking at Chris. There's this camera over there. I have not seen Weekend at Bernie's, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. Well, that was a classic 80s movie. So, uh, geez, one of these days I got to sit all you guys down. Yeah, I'm going to have to binge watch all these 80s movies that I make reference to. Anyway, that was a pretty uh, famous, uh, famous uh, movie. Anyway, so the point of the matter here is that um, I do believe that uh, cryptocurrencies are now uh, here. <laughs> you know, uh, five, 10 years ago when we were in this space, it was kind of like, well, they, you know, you'd say cryptocurrencies out in the public and they'd be like, well, what's that? Now, ironically enough, you go down the street and you say cryptocurrencies and you can either get a couple different looks. Uh, people who bought the top of the market, you know, you might get a punch in the nose. Um, and then, of course, you know, the 1% is programming the public. So a certain degree you're going to have, especially now, that this little uh, fool uh, doing that FTX Alameda nonsense uh, has basically sullied this space, which I think was done on purpose. Um, um, you're probably going to have a lot of people now in the public going, ooh, cryptocurrencies, they should be illegal. Now think of that, that little guy running around wearing track pants, uh, thinking he was going to reinvent the wheel kind of idea. Wow, did he ever learn a hard lesson? So, uh, I don't know. But the point here is that I think crypto has arrived. It is on the scene. Um, I don't know whether you're going to get that million-dollar moonshot on Bitcoin. I could very easily see in this coming cycle, eh, kind of like last cycle, we hit 20 Gs uh, two cycles ago uh, through Donald Trump's uh, presidency. And, of course, that was a ramp up into the CME futures launch, which is pretty cliche. Then we got this most recent cycle, which was really more about DeFi and, of course, kind of vilifying the, the space. Um, and uh, the price only got up to 65, right? That's what, that's a two, two and an eighth kind of, um, I guess a little more than that. Three X, we'll say, three, three and a half, somewhere in that. So, ugh. 
maybe we rally up to 100 Gs. That, that wouldn't be unrealistic. Um, I'm sure there's probably some geometric progression. And if you actually did the math, we could figure that out. Because it went like uh, 1,100, 1,200 bucks to uh, 20 Gs. So there's probably some sort of mathematical relationship there. And then 20 Gs to sit 65. So there's some sort of mathematical relationship there. Uh, and that should probably, whatever that ratio is, so just continuing it over time, that should probably tell us where our next peak is. So I don't know whether we go up into the million dollar mark or, you know, I see 20X on Bitcoin. That does seem a bit steep. Um, but, you know, only time will tell, as they say. I guess a good couple hundred Gs, that would uh, probably be uh, acceptable in most Bitcoiners' minds. That would be like, well, I guess that would be like two and a half, three X still. So anyway. Um, okay, so blah, 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 rhetoric, rhetoric, rhetoric. Uh, I suppose, you know, we'll just do a quick shill. Um, I'll uh, circle around afterward and remind you of this later on. But uh, we do have a, a raffle coming up here. Um, and we also have uh, a new school term starting. Um, I had always been a little bit leery in the past about uh, um, making making it only available to actually purchase uh, at the time of the schools open. I mean, if somebody wants to take the course or they're told, go and just register, make sure you're in this upcoming terms course, well, then just give them the ability to do it. So I do like how the team has sort of come full circle. Also, too, I have to say, we are awfully generous here, still offering this course. I mean, hell, I went to the grocery store the other day, and the price of the loaf of bread was up 10% just in like a couple of weeks' time. I mean, it's ridiculous, the hyperinflation that's going on in my country right now. Um, and it's on everything. Uh, it, it's right across the board. It's just embarrassing. And frankly speaking, I'm not even quite sure how these people can actually look at themselves straight in the face. To, Hello. Whoops, somebody's chit-chatting away. Maybe, Chris, you could throw yourself on mute. Hey, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so, you know, maybe take advantage of the fact, I mean, I, I'm actually surprised we are still just giving this away here for a thousand bucks. But if you want to learn how to run your uh, own small business of trading, man, I don't think there's, I've never seen anything that even holds a candle to what we do at TRI. I do see a lot of sort of educational programs that touch on certain things and I'll use my squiggly line. It makes money 99% of the time, which of course I think is a lot of horse hockey. Anyway, you probably should build your trading plan expecting that whatever system that you're using at best works, maybe like two thirds of the time. If you can get into those kind of numbers over long-term records, then you are killing it. But of course, the most important thing about all of this is you got to make darn sure that your average winner is bigger than your average loser. So what scares me with guys that uh, run systems and they say my system's like profitable 99% of the time, you find that, yeah, you book a whole bunch of little winning trades and then you have to take one losing trade that's an absolute mess. I heard a guy, I heard a, today, I heard a guy say that he shorts cryptocurrencies and he does not use stop loss orders. And it's like, okay, maybe that works 99 times out of 100. But that one time that doesn't work and there's some sort of short squeeze, that might just destroy you. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, I was an investment advisor. I was a fellow of the Canadian Securities Institute, although I didn't renew my designation, i.e. pay them a ton of money every year, just another tax. So I'm not officially allowed to advertise that I'm not an FCSI anymore. <laughs> I mean, the system is so corrupt, it's ridiculous. Anyway, um, I was a prop trader. In fact, actually, the uh, firm that I used to prop trade for, I see them on YouTube all over the place. And it's so funny watching them talk about trade setups. Like Hogue's always like, hey, anything can happen. 
Although I have been trading a while, and usually when I see that, and I'm a fan of this Jim Dalton guy, and man, he always talks about this, and but anything can happen, so you manage risk appropriately, blah, blah, blah. That's that's the way a typical real-life trader talks. Uh, so be careful. You know, if anything, if you got your journals out, coming from a guy who's been at this business an awfully long time, uh, just try and be careful out there. And, you know, sites and products and stuff that it, if they're being promoted by a guy that looks like he could be, you know, flipping burgers at McDonald's, be careful because one wrong move and he might be right back flipping burgers at McDonald's. <laughs> so please just be careful. There's, I have two rules of investing. And I tell you, if people follow the two rules of investing, it's actually very difficult to lose money at this game. But man, people have a really hard time following the rules. I'll tell you that much by crackers. So new school terms starting up. Like I said, we are in between terms right now. And, you know, I have uh, talked about it a lot, um, but probably not actually as much as I want to. Probably want to talk about it more. I do believe that there is a huge opportunity coming down the pike here. Uh, and I've been sort of working away on this document. Um, I definitely think that we're not in the bull yet, which of course is just going to piss everybody off. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, I have it in here. Let's see. Do I, do I, do I, are you somewhere in here? Oh, darn. Oh, fudge. Uh, I thought I had it in here. Anyway, I still need to uh, update this a little bit more. Um, in fact, you know, the best place to find it, I think, is actually on the website. Uh, where are we here? This website's turning into a really powerful engine here now. Uh, remember what I said? Uh, you probably heard this before. Fives and sixes. If you're an investor, you want to pay attention. Uh, crypto, man, just incredible opportunity here now. Um, but what I wanted to show you was the blog. And actually, we kind of reorganized the dashboard a little bit. So nice to see that we have the blog right on the dashboard here. Um, but I do believe that uh, market's going to look something along uh, these lines uh, through the year 2023. I get the impression that we were somewhere up in this area and seasonally, it makes sense. Uh, you know, pressing up 20, I guess, 30,000 kind of area. And the thing is, is the market will just keep going up until it stops going up. And anybody out there predicting the market will go to this exact level and pivot on that exact level. And you can get into that business and you might be right seven times out of 10, but I can absolutely guarantee you that three times out of 10 that you do that, and you're wrong, the public will literally hang you up by the balls uh, and might even bankrupt you in court suing you uh, if you get into that business line. So I would not get into the business of predicting what the hell is going to happen in the market because most times, like I said, you could be right seven, eight times out of 10. It's the two, three times out of 10 that you're wrong that uh, you really pay for it. So uh, my advice is just don't get into that business. But I definitely think that there will be some sort of push uh, lower. I actually think that we get one push lower here in May, June, and then another push lower into sort of September, October. And ironically enough, if you can weather this storm and you're sitting here next December, January, February, and you haven't been euchred out of, of good positions, and you've taken the opportunity to load up on good quality names down at the bottom end of the ranges when people start talking about things like Bitcoin going to zero, and it's all over, and it's all a scam, and you start hearing about 51% attacks, and you're in there on the buy side through that, then I think you're really well positioned for this coming bull. Um, I did listen to one video today, and I think it's sort of just a reiteration. Um, you know, one thing I absolutely love about TRI that does it, uh, it fills me with a lot of joy is uh, the fact that we've built this community and nobody in the community is out to sort of screw anybody else over. There's no vested interest. Nobody sells anything in here. 
and whatever we're buying, we're buying as individual traders and investors. So, you know, Shark Toshi here is just an awesome uh, core member of our community. He's a, I guess, uh, I think he's he's a cool instructor for the level two program. Uh, I think he's also helping out with the TA for the level one program as well. So total all star. Anyway, he was sharing this video here today, and really, I got to I, I got to give the guys props. Of course, these are the kind of guys like, oh, you get Steven Rich, whatever. I you got to respect this guy. He even said through his interview here that hey, for a while he was living in his car, right, and uh, trying to save money and uh, uh, washing dishes. Uh, I've told people repeatedly uh, on the site. You have to make sure that you've got your nut covered. There's no way you can become, uh, you know, part of the 1% or, you know, to be a, a killer trader. If you are trying to learn how to trade and learn how to invest properly and have to live off of that money at the same time, it's almost impossible. It's, I, I'll tell you, I've never seen anybody else do it. This guy's really, you know, he basically in this interview, and I thought it was a very constructive interview that he had with uh, this gentleman. I don't know who he is, but, you know, this is the one thing that I really love about the TRI site is that we're all sort of just sharing stuff. And, you know, he's not really, this guy here isn't really shilling a particular product. I think he is shilling his, you know, member of the cool dude club or something like that. Uh, and if you want to go down that line, fine, so be it, whatever. But the point here is that I think there's a lots of nuggets of wisdom uh, through Josh's share. And if you are a part of the TRI community and stuff, of course, we're constantly posting stuff and charts and ideas and videos. And, and I love that about uh, this site. It's very, very interactive. Uh, great, great environment to learn you know, where to cut your teeth, how to cut your teeth in these bull markets. So super proud. Thank you, um, Sharky, for that post. Um, and um, and like I said, I don't, I don't think I tweeted it out. I think I sort of liked it. I did hit the like button. But I might even uh, suggest in that actually at the 36 minute mark, if I'm not mistaken, uh, right, it was right around here. I don't know if I'm allowed to do this or not. There you go. Yep. So right here at about the 35, 36 minute mark, we'll even say it right here. It basically tells you, and of course, I don't think anybody can do this without planning ahead of time. So I definitely think it's super important that you do things like work with a trading plan of course, you know, you want help building your plan, you can always talk to us or just watch all these free videos like uh, that. Uh, I think his name was Great Del Moody or something like that. Who knows what the hell his real name is? Uh, he just he just learned how to build a plan and trade plan, trade setups just from watching all my free videos. So, you know, it works. If you need a helping hand, consider joining our education program. But this guy right here, uh, we'll just say even uh, we'll say at 35 minute mark basically lays out how to get rich <laughs> from crypto uh, for the coming cycle. And I hate to say it, it's it's actually pretty straightforward stuff. It's, it's not rocket science, right? I've shown you these images before. Um, put that away for now. Um, there, let's see, do I have it in here? I think I have it in here. Uh, you know, here was, uh, this is an interesting one, although I don't, you know what I need to do is I need to put the links to these so you can pull these things out in a bigger picture. I mean, we all know that this is basically what the venture cap cycle looks like. I think that we're basically right in this area right here. I think we got one more punch in the nose coming ahead of us into, so like I said, I, I don't know whether the dip here in the spring takes us to new lows. I wouldn't be surprised if the dip here takes us back down against those previous lows into a whole bunch of technical objectives and stuff down below. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, especially I think there's going to be a big showdown in the States over uh, the whole debt ceiling debate, which really... To be perfectly honest, if it was up to me, I would actually really like to see the Republican Party 
say, no, no more debt. It, it's over. And literally see the debt market collapse, see interest rates go to double digits. The US dollar index actually get its credibility back in the world stage as a reserve currency. People can actually believe in it. That I think would be a good idea. It would mean just an absolute ton of pain for Joe Sixpack. And you'll probably see that the banksters are gonna cry bloody murder. And since of course they own all the media outlets, uh, they're going to make just every single day, oh my God, can you believe what's happened? It's all the Republicans' fault. It's the end of the world. When really what it would do is it would actually set our society up. And of course, substitute drama teachers here uh, should get the message loud and clear that they just can't go and just print money out of nowhere and expect that not to have repercussions. Having said that, I don't think that that is going to happen, which is sad. So I think it's what should happen. But unfortunately, I don't think that the 1% is going to allow that to happen. Uh, and there will be enough media rhetoric that Joe Sixpack public in the United States is going to be, I'm going to call my congressman and make sure that he passes the debt ceiling uh, limit uh, thing or whatever the hell you want to call it. So that Mr. Biden can continue his socialist dream along with substitute drama teachers and Klaus the commie. Anyway, <laughs> there's a little bit of rhetoric for you. So anyway, point of the matter here is these cycles don't really change. It's exactly the same thing every bloody cycle. So can you force yourself to come in at the bottom end of the cycle and start accumulating? And of course, remember that at the bottom part of the cycle, the 1%, they're the ones buying. And the only way they can buy is if you are selling in size because they buy in size. Oh, darn. Yeah, actually, I need to do a little bit more work on this because a couple images that I wanted to show you are not here. But on the blog, if I'm not mistaken, um, yeah, this is the image I wanted to show you guys. I mean, it's stunningly cliche how this goes, folks. So uh, this was the 1216 cycle, and you can see big face rip. Uh, if anything, I think this second move up here caught the whole market by surprise. Because, uh, and it actually bankrupted Roly Poly Oly. The interesting, uh, how many of you people know who I'm talking about when I say Roly Poly Oly? Hey, Nora, you gave us a donation. You're such a sweetheart, Nora. I love you. Hugs and kisses. Five euros. Woo-hoo, thanks, sir. Oh, well, what a nice treat. You know, uh, kind of miss, um, and we just don't see around anymore. What, what the hell happened to, um, uh, what's his face? Eddie. Hey. When you were over in Europe, did uh, Eddie ever talk to uh, talk to uh, Andrea? Because Eddie and Andrea were pretty close, weren't they? Yeah, early on when I first got there, uh, I was talking to Eddie too. Uh, Eddie's kind of fell off. I don't, I'm not exactly sure what happened to him. Yeah, uh, it was kind of weird, eh? I yeah. Missed the guy. Anyway, he was a real character. Anyway, so thank you, uh, Nuri. Uh, you're a sweetheart. Uh, Roly Poly Oly, SBF? Nope. Good try. Uh, that was two generations later. Who is Roly Poly Oly? And actually, I would be curious to see whether Chris even knows who I'm talking about. And the funny thing is, I'll give you the hint. He spent so much time in Japanese prison, he's not so Roly Poly Oly anymore eating rice every day. <laughs> so, any idea who I'm talking about, Chris? I've heard you make reference to Roly Poly Oly in the past, oh, but uh, no. I think he was before my time in crypto, I want to say. Anybody over there on YouTube? Uh, and I gave you the, the biggest hint possible. <laughs> and you, you might make the guy who was thrown in prison before that reference. And that was back when Bitcoin was actually used for some pretty nefarious stuff. Uh, but he's in a U.S. federal prison and he ain't never getting out. Uh, it would be interesting if you know who I'm referring to there. So uh all right afa that's close and isn't that interesting how even now that's good donna actually donna's good there you go no no big connect that's way after way after no carpellis carpellis was uh roly poly -oly. he was the guy running gox 
And the funny thing is, is that right after the Silk Road reversal, all of a sudden there was this um, uh, algo that just came alive and it just started buying Bitcoin like crazy. And they called it the Willy Bot, which was kind of funny because, of course, I've got a technical indicator that I call the Willy. And when I came in, people always were like connecting me with this willy bot and i'm like no 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 i don't have anything to do with that don't don't label that shit on me <laughs> but anyway so the willy bot just went absolutely crazy hey there you go tequila knows uh now th if you know that name tequila then i know that you are a crypto og and really if you really want to know what crypto is really all about you have to know who uh, who Tequila made reference to there. So uh, if I was handing out cigars at Tequila, you got the uh, prize for really knowing your crypto trivia. Roly Poly Oli, he was just a side character. Ross, uh, that, that guy was shit. <laughs> so for the record, if you're going to go and actually get a contract out on somebody's life, don't do it online. Everything that you do online, every single word that I say here on these videos online is being recorded and Big Brother is listening. They may not be like listening with active ears. They're probably just passively listening, but everything is categorized. Everything is logged. So then that way, if I do do something really stupid down the road, then they can just go back and see my entire history of everything that I've said and done. And this is what killed Ross. And ironically enough, it was what killed uh, Roly Poly Oli. And ironically enough, it's actually what kills a lot of these crypto kids is they actually think that for some reason, because you're dealing in crypto, that you're anonymous. That's just, you know, there are some people that believe that the CIA has actually created this shell of this thing called the internet. And it's almost funny because like Russia has built sort of this, this shell around Russia and it thinks that it's actually immune and it can like shield itself and probably also too within communist China. But what they don't realize is that the CIA is standing outside of this whole thing, just watching everything that's happening from outside. I, that wouldn't surprise me one bit. Anyway, all right, back to our story. Got a side rail talking about Ross and Rolly. So the point of the matter here is big rally. Uh, like I said, probably took a uh, market off uh, guard, but you can see, you know, this was the 1720 cycle. And like I said, I think this move was very coordinated because it was the listing of uh, the Bitcoin futures on the CME. And I actually think that this was supposed to be the cycle top, believe it or not. Kind of get the impression this past cycle actually kind of took the market off guard a little bit, you know, especially with the whole advent of the um, of the um, uh, DeFi space. I also think too that the one percent they were also caught with their pants down uh, through the whole sickness environment. Um, so you know there is a debate, you know, as to whether this market should have gone to new highs here or not. You know, unfortunately, with the sickness, that has completely exacerbated all of this debt issue and money printing. I mean, it's it's the whole world's just gone to fucking haywire. Right? I had some people ask me because they've said recently that you know I've this is just my history in Bitcoin, but man, I've done like this kind of detailed analysis since the very first day I started working in the markets, which was back in the 1980s. <laughs> so um, I get the impression that uh, this is probably going to be the hardest environment for you to prosper in as an individual, uh, probably your entire lives. Some of you young people, you're going to go through this environment and then by the time you actually get to my age uh, or maybe even a little bit older, you're actually going to have to see this revisited. Thankfully, I sure hope so. This I'll only have to go through this once in my lifetime. 
because when I was very, very young, that's when the last great reset bullshit garbage crock of oligarch horse crap <laughs> was rammed down our society's throats. Um, and unfortunately, this go round, they actually had to make up a war. You know, in the 1940s, of course, they had Hitler to blame. So that was a nice, easy, convenient. You know, you could actually make the argument that Hitler was actually put in place by the Western oligarchs, but we won't open up that can of worms today. Um, I think you could make the argument that Vladi, to a certain degree, was actually put in place by the Western oligarchs. I mean, he was some low-level uh, KGB thug um, that basically came into power and gave all of these uh, oligarchs of the Russians. But, you know, keep in mind that they actually needed all of these Western nations' capital to get their economy back uh, up and running following the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, you know, and he just sort of materialized out of nowhere, which was really bizarre. So uh, in my eyes, I mean, I'm sure other people can explain it with a straight face, but to me, they're very suspicious, that whole story. And I wouldn't be surprised 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, we find out that actually he was just a CIA mole the whole time. It wouldn't surprise me one bit anyway. Uh, and then unfortunately, what ends up happening, just like Hitler, is, you know, yeah, they're put into place initially. And then they turn around and, you know, they always say, don't bite the hand that feeds you. So then they end up biting the hand that feeds me, and that leads to their destruction. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's what's going to happen to Mr. Putin as well. But anyway, only time, what the hell. That's a little bit of political rhetoric from Brian. I guess the point that I'm just trying to make with you guys here is hopefully you look at this image and you go, gee whiz, is, is history just basically repeating itself? And these the great part about Bitcoin is that... Um, I think because it has this built-in happening effect, it's quite li literally like every four years, they basically just reset the whole fundamental story. So, you know, you could make the argument one of the reasons why stories actually end up sort of going out of favor <laughs> and people lose uh, interest is because the price gets bid up so much relative to fundamental value. It just doesn't make sense. But the fact that Bitcoin basically shops it's have uh, it's quote unquote fundamental value in half every four years means that every four years they hit the reset button on this thing which i think is it's it's a fascinating like you know they always <clears throat> i i've made the argument and this is just brian's personal opinion that of course bitcoin was a cia pet project from day one um and if you were going to build something to try and combat the uh, federal banking system, but federal is the wrong word, think cartel banking system, that the cartel has no interest in the actual value of whatever monetary unit they're using. The cartel jumps from things like German marks, French francs, British pounds, US dollars, whatever the thing du jour is, and they'll just keep milk it, milking uh, this cow. Remember, they loan at interest, and the at interest, technically, according to the Bible, is, is illegal. And if it's anything... The one thing that I'm very proud of about the Muslim and uh, religion is the fact that they actually try to a certain degree to try and limit that usury. Um, this, you know, sadly, this is the hallmark of, of this human experience. And it goes back thousands of years, you know, all the way back to uh, good old JC in the temple. So nothing's really changed here. So if you were going to build something that was going to insulate you from that. And keep in mind, this is now, I would make the argument that the banksters are basically in bed with the, uh, the, you know, call it the deep state or whatever the hell you want to call it. 
uh, global, uh, you know, order, Klaus and all that nonsense. This is the perfect vehicle to basically insulate yourself from this. Because interestingly enough, it turns out that the money cycle also just so happens to be on a four-year curve. And uh, I show you guys this repeatedly. It might be hard for you to see this, uh, but I think I even have this document in here. Um, uh, how am I going to do this? Actually, you know, probably easier just to uh, show you this on uh, on a trading view chart. Um, that's this image. You've all seen this a hundred times. There's a cool uh, image here. Is um, this is um, the past 40 years uh, cycle. So here is that four year money cycle goes from uh, inexpensive money to expensive money to inexpensive money to expensive money to inexpensive money to expensive money. You could make the argument that that Bitcoin just follows this exact same path. Uh, and when we get to the point where money is super expensive and the people that are running the money system, um, a.k.a. the cartel, have decided that, all right, uh, the uh, system is ready for uh, money to start getting cheap again. Lo and behold, here comes a Bitcoin happening. <laughs> and when, of course, they uh, decide money is going to get cheap again, what usually happens through these, of course, this is Burr, right and if it's not a burr from uh from actual fed printing which in itself is very unique that doesn't normally happen what normally happens is governments go on these stupid deficit spending binges and the thing is is through this last cycle through that demographic cycle governments couldn't raise taxes governments couldn't uh hyperinflate through uh, you know, devaluing their currencies because the economics just couldn't afford it. And of course, all the banks were on their knees anyway. So it wasn't like the banks were going to be able to lend any money. So uh, as a result, they had to resort to actual outright money printing. Now that we've gotten through that particular demographic uh, part of the cycle, think Jupiter, Saturn, Cross. So this was a Jupiter, Saturn, Cross. This was the end of actually a very, very tight long term uh, monetary uh, cycle and what you just went through Jupiter Saturn cross all the sickness and all that crap this is Klaus's great reset this is the very end of a very cheap monetary cycle so basically we have to spend the next 40 years going back to a very very expensive monetary uh, part of the cycle and interest rates my hunch is that actually interest rates will now friend higher for the next 40 years oh, great uh the good part about it though is that uh hopefully you know and by the end of that 40 year period yeah you probably have your bitcoin at millions of dollars that wouldn't surprise me but just here in the short term i the good part about this i mean good bad we just went through a cycle peak in bitcoin price and of course that was the end of easy cheap money We've gone through this cycle where money is expensive and it's getting more expensive. And of course, you had all the, you know, the altcoin names all blow up and, you know, that all disappear, SBF and all that nonsense, Luna and all that nonsense, right? That all gets washed out of the system. And you can see how close we are to getting ready to start the next uh, cycle. So if anything, that's kind of a good thing. It's just, we're just not there just yet. And so this is the number one reason why I think that 23, uh, I don't know where I had it, but 23 uh, still has to, um, uh, do, 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 where are you? Uh, it has to look like this. So still think there's one more uh, in the in kick in the nuts. And if you think about it from the cost of money, and interestingly enough, the cost of money has not topped out here yet. Uh, there are no, there was a potential W coming in here. 
Uh, and actually, it's interesting. There was a gentleman, um, George Gammon. He was all the rage in the uh, in the uh, sickness market. I don't see too many videos of from him lately, but who knows? Uh, he likes to interview this other gentleman. I can't remember his name. Uh, Euro Dollar University guy, something along those lines. Uh, that is this same product. This orange line is the Euro Dollars. Um, I look at the market a little differently than those kind of people, but I would just simply say here that it is the market's vote on short-term interest rates. And anybody who was following the Euro dollar market saw that interest rates actually were starting to break in earnest way before the Fed ever started raising interest rates. So I think that they were they were on to something and Mr. Euro dollar University guy, I think he's on to something. The way that I would interpret this is that we won't see that this money cycle actually starts getting easier on us until we actually start seeing this orange line uh, W out and start trending higher. Um, at that point, then it will be, all you will hear is the Fed talking about how they won the war on inflation, how the economy needs stimulus, uh, how we need to support uh, the venture capital market, blah, 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 blah. But that's just not here right now. If anything, they're still kind of waging war on uh, the venture capital market right now. And I hate to say it, I don't see a bottom in interest rate, or I guess a top in interest rates yet. This still looks like it's going up. So be forewarned, right? And I'm a little bit worried that people in the crypto market and even in the stock market and stuff, have just assumed that the Fed is done. I don't see any evidence here whatsoever that the Fed is done. Now show me W's, show me the orange line starting to perk back up and you can look in previous cycles. Sometimes it actually takes quite a while for this to actually turn back up. And actually as this kind of a side note for all you historians, it was right in here. And I think Mr. Trump, he probably has a bunch of uh, very smart economists uh, on staff that do the same sine wave analysis. This isn't rocket science, what I'm doing here. And you remember back in 2018, Mr. Trump was bitching to uh, Jerry at the Federal Reserve Board saying, why are interest rates so high? Uh, interest rates should be coming down. What the hell's going on? Uh, but it took the sickness to actually get them off their asses to actually start lowering rates. But anyway, that's another conversation for another day. So point of the matter here is I don't like uh, big butts, but I cannot lie. No, no, that's not it. What do I like? I was hoping I'd get a laugh from Chris, but no, no laughs. Oh, well. <laughs> I know I, I know my jokes land when I get a smile on Chris's face. But I didn't get any smiles there. Anyway. Um, I like the idea that we are going through the bottoming process. Uh, and, it, you know, bring this full circle. Why did I go down all this rant? If you think that there's the Bitcoin happening event, then we go back to our historical study, uh, which was over here, if I'm not mistaken. Um, when did I have that? I think there. Bitcoin happenings. If I had got myself prepared and started accumulating about six months or so ahead, you notice the W that came in here? Would that have been a good idea? How about this one? Bitcoin happening event about six, eight months before. Hey, look at that. There's a big weekly, monthly W. If I'd start accumulating, would that have been a good idea? Vroom. Keep in mind, this is a log scale. <laughs> All right, six months before the happening, you remember the sickness market? I've told you guys repeatedly, and if you've never seen this before, write it down. If you ever see the price of Bitcoin crashing and it has absolutely nothing to do with Bitcoin, in this case, this was all about the sickness and should we debate work to your kids' future to save these stupid uh, over-leveraged companies? Shut the fuck up and give them the money. We got to save capitalism. I'll sacrifice my life to save capitalism. You got to be kidding me. 
If you ever hear anybody talking that stupidly, ironically enough, that's actually capitulation. That is the bottom. And of course, I've told you guys repeatedly, and if you haven't heard this before, write it down. Anytime you hear about the government or quasi-government, in this case, the cartel, come in and actually guarantee the floor of the market, that's time to buy. You know, really perfect analogy of this, and actually probably most of you probably don't even remember this now. Uh, I do remember, actually, I was thinking about it the other day. That, you know, my first job I actually got in the stock market was the year following this event. Um, and um, now probably none of you even remember this, but uh, right here. Mr. Alan Greenspan, when this day happened right here, this, you can see, this is a daily price chart. Uh, am I on the right year? Just got to make sure I am. Yep. So 1987. And this day right here, in one day, he came out and he basically took interest rates to like zero and just like that. And not zero. I think he dropped it like one full percentage point or something like that. And he said, any liquidity, anybody needs any money, I got your back. And they, you know, they called it the Alan Greenspan put. And you can see that ultimately, yeah, it took some time for everything to settle down. But, you know, that set the base and the market never saw those prices again. And you can make the argument, same sort of thing. It was completely unrelated but it was uh, blamed, of course, on a terrorist event. We won't talk about uh, the relevance of that. But it's really interesting. Through this event, there is 9-11 right in here. The day that I knew that the stock market was actually a bottom, right, there was 9-11 right there. Interesting. That's a daily chart. So there is 10th of September. And notice the next candle, 17th of December. So I guess they halted trading. I don't even remember. But um, I don't remember them. I wonder if this is actually missing data. I do remember that the stock market was basically in free fall. And I remember this stock market got down to a print under 8,000. And I remember specifically that day, the pension funds actually all went in and started buying the stock market up when the Dow was below 8,000 here. So it's interesting now oh, that does not even print a print below 8,000. So that's kind of odd. Are they kind of fucking with the prices here? Maybe a little bit trading view? Hmm. Uh, I remember it specifically. I remember seeing it. Maybe it might have been the following year. I can't remember just off the top of my head. Maybe that was down in here when the pension funds were buy, finally buying. But I do remember that, um, and actually you can even go and see this. The very first repo that uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve did was down in this area, and it was basically guaranteeing the floor of the market. So that was interesting. Maybe that when the pension funds came in, that might have been down in here. So the interesting thing about this was actually this was right around when my son was born. My son was born right uh, here. And actually, I was kind of out of the market through that because, unfortunately, um, um, well, I don't, we don't need to get into that. He was diagnosed special needs, all that. It was a pretty tough pregnancy. So anyway, so the point is, is that um, anytime, and especially through here, this was such a good historical lesson. Anytime here you hear that the market is going to be guaranteed by the government, that's, that's a screaming buy. And what was so ironic about this is I even remember specifically in January, I went on and on and on and on and on and on and on about, oh, there was a January leap options expiry and there was a massive transfer of wealth, a whole bunch, like just hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uh, call options all expired in the money through this. There was news of Jeff Bezos was selling tons and tons and tons of Amazon stock, the whole damn thing, and nobody in the public said boo about it. And then we started getting into the sickness. And I remember even specifically through here, Julian going, 
you know, this is serious stuff. This is not going to go very well. And and a lot of people were kind of like, well, I don't know what's going to happen. Or we'll see. And sure enough, Julian was right. Uh, it was a total meltdown. And then, like I said, at this point, all of a sudden, now the uh, government is encouraged to go and get taxpayers' money and bail out the system um, down here, not up here. This is where all the insiders sold down here. And then, of course, what did the insiders do following that? They bought everything back. And even uh, Bill Gates himself even came out publicly and said, I'm buying all of Mexico right now because that's it. We're all moving our business back to Mexico. How did he know that that was going to happen? Hmm. Interesting. But anyway, conversation for another day. All right. Blah, 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 blah. So where was I going with all of this? I like a uh, big butt, as I said, and I cannot lie. Uh, I like this kind of thinking here. And actually, I even put a chart out just uh, even recently on social media. And uh, I think that was this chart. And I think cycle-wise, this reminds me a hell of a lot of 2014, 2015. And this big bull run, like I said, I don't think that should have happened. The only reason why it did happen was because that Willy bot went absolutely nuts, <laughs> which is kind of funny. But in hindsight, of course, it destroyed that Gox guy, uh, Roly Poly Oli. He never expected this to happen. And of course, you know, he had gone and spent everybody's Bitcoin. So uh, he was kind of like, uh-oh, People actually want to sell Bitcoins up here and get out and get their money back. Well, now what do I do? <laughs> and of course, the rest is history. I think that the top was supposed to look something along these lines, but you know, you can blame the Willy Bot on that. But the subsequent correction, reload zones. This is, of course, everything that I teach you guys. And I remember going through this with the site people. And at that point, we were just talking on TradingView over on like these kind of places. I almost never go over here anymore because it's just, I don't know, it's it, it's just bizarre going into this kind of environment and talking with the public. I just don't do it anymore. I probably, I suppose I should. But anyway, uh, said the same thing here. You know, usually uh, corrections, usually they last about 18 months or so, a year and a half. So, you know, if we're looking at a weekly chart, what's a year and a half um, uh, on weeks? That's what, uh, 52 plus 26 is 78. All right. So there is 78. That's a pretty typical bear market from there to there. Uh so we're about ready. I mean, we're we're due uh, for this market to start turning back up. I will say, though, that you notice that, and then, of course, you know, to finish this sort of original thought that I had said to you, and this is where I think this comes into this kind of uh, conversation. If you can just force yourself, you know, about six months prior to the happening event, not that one, uh, Oh, well, I guess it's fine. Six months prior to the happening event, if you can just start, you know, got to start accumulating, usually you can do pretty darn well uh, in this space. So I'm not really saying that it, it, it's going to happen. All I'm just going to simply say is we ideally want to try and buy value if we're ever investing. What is value? The good part about POW is I think you can make the argument, like if we actually look at the uh, the Bitcoin uh, cost of production, uh, where are we here, um, metrics. And I did notice, I was a little bit surprised, but I did notice that a lot of the um, cost of production um, numbers, like the, uh, the, what do they call it? The, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The uh, difficulty, that's the word I'm looking for, has gone up quite a bit. I think you can make the argument things like S17s have been basically mothballed. That's old technology. S19s, you can see cost of production there is about 20 and change. 
as 19P. I think that's the next generation, 17. And I think that the sort of cutting edge uh, cost of production models right now, I like this 11, 12,000 area. Um, I did even see some articles back when we were down in this area that at that point there were uh, operations that had their cost of production around 7,000. So I would imagine that if you have a whole bunch of these low cost uh, machines and you can also produce in scale, maybe you have like bulk uh, electricity uh, contracts with utilities and stuff, you know, for like thousands of miners and stuff. Maybe you even, we used to joke back this cycle, you know, uh, and specifically here, wouldn't it be a good idea if you're the Russian Navy and you've got a whole bunch of these nuclear uh, submarines all lying around just collecting rust, wouldn't it be a good idea just to go and convert the nuclear reactor that creates energy and just plug in some Bitcoin miners? Like, wouldn't that, isn't that free energy? And you can just mine all the Bitcoin you want for nothing? Seemed logical to me. Anyway, uh, I don't know whether that's still the case or not, but I would make the argument that uh, anybody that can, you know, do contracts and size, it's interesting to see the people that want to put Bitcoin stuff out of business. They, of course, are making the environmental pitch right now, which is a load of horse shit anyway. But uh, I mean, anytime you think for a moment and write this down, because I love this as a simple analogy of what government's motivations really are. If you ever for a moment think about governments actually do things for like environmental purposes and it's not some sort of special interest con job by the the recently elected politician that wants to get their particular pet project pushed through go look in your fucking mailbox i mean it's embarrassing literally every single day i go look in my mailbox and it is filled with this garbage advertising and that is all promoted by your government and if anybody was like you know maybe we should stop using trees and start thinking about taking co2 out of the environment the last thing in the world they would endorse is ad mail and why does it happen and why has it not, you know, if all of these, you know, like my substitute drama teacher, what a fucking con job that guy is. If he was so environmentally friendly and so environmentally in tune, why would he not put the ad mail business out of business? I mean, it's the most environmentally unfriendly business possible. That was interesting. You know, I, ironically enough, you can even listen to some of these techno geek guys. Uh, Billy Gates talks about how uh, the cement industry is actually the worst environmental polluter uh, in the world. You don't hear anybody talking about the cement industry, do you? Well, because it's not in uh, the, you know, the government's best interest to put the cement uh, industry out of business. <laughs> you know? So always you know, just understand that, especially when it comes, I mean, let's, we'll do a poll. Let's see if anybody's even listening to me. How can you tell a democratically elected politician is lying to you? It's really easy, folks. <laughs> Either Chris is saying goodbye to me because he's like, Brian, you're going to so get assassinated. You better shut the hell up. Or, or he's mimicking something. <laughs> so, I mean, let's just call a spade a spade, right? I mean, Half of my job is just to stop with the bullshit. Just tell it like it is. You know, I've told you guys repeatedly, you really want to know what the hell's going on in this world and why the world works the way that it does. You have to watch this video. It's painful. Uh, it's, in, 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 you know, infuriating. Uh, you know, the main cause of income inequality. Uh, specifically, of course, uh, I direct everybody to uh, this video, which I think, frankly speaking, should be required watching. I don't even know if this is the actual person. Um, 
that uh, the, this is the gentleman right here. I can't remember his name just off the top of my head. But, you know, if you really want to know what's really going on in this world, you have to watch this video. I'll put it in the YouTube. And the good part about it is I think so many people in the world now have seen it that it would be kind of, it wouldn't make sense for them to actually censor this because if all of a sudden these videos disappear, then you'd know that, uh, well, there you go. The 1% is just all fucking us again. So anyway, the point of the matter here is you, half of my job is just let's quit with the bullshit. Why are these global actors acting the way that they are? Why does this system work the way that it does? Uh, you know, hopefully I'm not as foul mouth, but as I said, um, you know, the site is a fantastic resource. You know, like this is what we talk about uh, on the site. And I even tell people this, right? Uh, you know, in the lounge here, right? Um, said uh, the process is what's important. Of course, these guys all like, yep, you know, tell it like it is, Brian. But, you know, this is the process is that, yeah, my job is just to, is to just teach you about all of these things at the dinner table. What the hell is this fork used for? Why why is there a knife up here, but then there's all these knives over here? Uh, why is there a fork up here, but not a fork over here? Like, what's the difference between this fork and that fork? Why is why, why are there four different uh, drinking vessels? <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's, it's not like... We're reinventing everything, anything. This this stuff actually historically, it's almost identical. In fact, I had a really enjoyable time, uh, I think two weekends ago, listening to a video presentation by a gentleman by the name of Jim Grant uh, on a on the first editor of the Economist magazine, who is his hero from like the 1850s <laughs> and I really enjoyed the interview it was a very very educational interview but it's there's nothing that changes here what changes sadly and it's a really sad commentary on our society is uh the goalposts of course keep getting moved and you know keep in mind that the one percent the only way that they can see succeed is they have to keep moving the goalposts. They have to keep changing the rules. Uh, they have to, you know, quite literally, we'll use this US dollar system until the market doesn't take it anymore. And as soon as the market doesn't take it anymore, then they'll move to a different system, right? Your strategic uh, drawing rights and all that kind of stuff. Hey, there you go. So Chris, there's a weekend at Bernie's. Uh, Josh even found that. That doesn't look at all familiar to you? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. So anyway, uh, that's a 1980s reference. So anyway, so back to our story. How do you find value in this world? Um, I think, you know, the good part about Bitcoin being proof of work. And one of the reasons why it hasn't been destroyed. Um, and I think it's here to stay. You know, what's interesting is whenever you listen to like, if you listen to that big, uh, the, 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 have you ever seen this guy? I mean, no offense, but you would think that from a PR perspective, uh, bank of international settlements, um, uh, I, I don't know. Is he the president? Maybe he owns the place. That's why he just doesn't give a fuck. But you would think that, uh, oh, look at that, and they won't even show his picture. Oh, hey, the guy's name, I, I mean, he's huge. He's ridiculous how big he is. I, I don't know what that, do you know what his name is, Chris? Uh, it, you know, it's fascinating. Whenever you listen to any of these guys, and I wanted to show you that, or, you know, Lagarde, uh, or even really Powell and stuff like that, you never hear them badmouth Bitcoin. Never. I never hear them. I've been, you know, like I watch this damn thing like a hawk 24 seven. I watch all the news. I mean, I've basically lived this life for 10 years. I've never heard any of these people badmouth Bitcoin. Now I have heard them, of course, go on and on and on about how bad cryptocurrencies are. What the hell is it, guys? You got to see this guy. I mean, 
He's he's bigger than life. <laughs> Which I think he his quite name is... literally is. There he is. Look at him. He's yeah. huge. Augustine Carstens. Oh, if what's his name? You know Augustine name? Carstens, if I'm saying his name correctly. I posted a link of his Wikipedia here in Zoom. There you go. I mean, like literally, I think he's eaten a couple bitcoins. Maybe that's why he <laughs> likes him so much. <laughs> and they just keep growing. That's not nice, shouldn't it? You know, that's uh, you know, in this woke world. I'm surprised there's not people that are overweight going, oh, yeah, cancel him, cancel him, you know, and all that talk. But nonetheless, that's a pretty, these guys, they absolutely hate cryptocurrency with a passion. But it's even fascinating how he won't really come out and badmouth Bitcoin itself. Uh, I don't know whether that's a, a falsehood. Maybe he badmouths Bitcoin. I don't know. But I would make the argument that because Bitcoin is POW, that means that there is actually value here. Work is valuable. Uh, is there a need in this world, given what you've seen from all these central banksters? Uh, I mean, would you, I mean, no offense, but would you trust Christine Lagarde with your life savings to do what's in your best interest or in her best interest? I mean, that's the scary part because theoretically we're supposed to be in a democratically elected society here. Keep in mind, Christine Lagarde is no bankster. She isn't even from a banking background. She's a lawyer by trade. How did, you know, when I was, First coming up in this world, we used to always joy, joke, don't call them lawyers, call them liars. Because a lawyer, if they know that their client is guilty, they will still defend them as absolutely hard as possible in an open court of law, maybe even to the point of deceit. Right? If the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. I don't know. You ever heard that line before? So, I, you know, by the way, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think our Uncle Jerry is a lawyer by background. All I'm saying to you is, can you openly and willingly trust these people to do what's in your best interest as an individual? Unequivocally, no, 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 no. Which is really sad, it's terrible commentary on our society. Bitcoin has a proof of work model. So if Bitcoin is to survive, then the network must be validated. Can I trust that there is enough people that have enough capital invested in this thing that they don't want to see Bitcoin disappear? Yes, I can trust that. There are a lot of people with a lot of money on the line here. And every time Bitcoin starts to get down into these areas, all of a sudden, the, the talk from the 1%, you never hear anybody mention Bitcoin. You hear them talk about the terrible people like SBF, when I'm frankly speaking, I think SBF and that FTX and the, the real crooked crook behind SBF, the guy who was running that poker site, you all know who I'm talking about, blatant criminality behavior. I think basically SBF was a, was a, a pawn in their game. Um. Frankly speaking, I don't think SBF is even smart enough to pull off the, the job that, that was pulled off there. Anyway, as I said earlier, like I love our site because we share all this uh, really cool information. I thought this guy had a really interesting take, but his attitude is everything's a Ponzi. The only way that you know it isn't a Ponzi is if... <laughs> You happen to find out an asset like Bitcoin. And this, of course, is why people like gold so much. 
is that it actually takes a certain amount of money to get an ounce of gold out of the ground. So that's why gold has an intrinsic value. It's difficult to find. So I like the idea that if you can actually identify value, then it's something that you can trust in this world because you cannot trust Jerry or Vladdy or Winnie or Christine. You cannot trust these people. It's as simple as that, folks. As simple as that. So do I think Bitcoin's going anywhere? Unequivocally not. <laughs> Bitcoin ain't going nowhere. But what you have to understand when you're playing this game is that value is what actually determines where this thing stops going down. And here, let's do a little trivia with you guys. And I want to see everybody answer this. How do we know that we are at or close to a bottom on the Bitcoin price? It's a really easy thing Every single one of you should know this. It's really easy. I've already said it. And I have said it to you guys repeatedly. Chris, do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Don't answer. I don't want you to give the public uh, away, but do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Maybe just type it here in the, in the Hangout because there's only... Actually, Cypher, good to see you. I did. Cypher actually was as an active participant in the uh, in the day trader room, and then yes, thank you, perfect. Uh, and then uh, and then uh, we said, look, at, you're not allowed to post until you finish the exams. And he's like, ah, oh, you fucking assholes. <laughs> good, Nore. No, Adam, I'm talking about what is it that we cannot allow to happen. Nora got it. Uh, Chris got it, right? Because if this happens in the whole blockchain, all of Bitcoin, the whole damn thing is meaningless, worthless. So you just can't let that happen. The answer is what Nora posted there. And I'm kind of sad. Josh is right here saying if economic bubbles was a person, so he's definitely active posting, and he should have been one of the first people to answer this. Uh, what are you doing, Luke, Jason, Pete M, Big House? All of you should be answering this. It should be like literally sp spilling out of your mouth. So anyway, I find it interesting that back here, what well, we did here is people starting to talk about 51% attacks and mysteriously the price of Bitcoin started rallying. Do we have any talk about 51% attacks right now, folks? Chris, have you heard anybody talking about 51% of tax? Somebody's saying, Brian, why are there four different costs of production? Well, each of these costs of production lines is a different minor. So if you, uh, you know, of course, this guy went and ate them all. So it's awfully tough for me to show you. But if we go like S17 minor. There is your S17. And we can go the S19 minor, which was the next generation. There's, I guess, your S19s. And yeah, then, you know, I guess, but then they went crazy, right? Instead of jacking the numbers up, they started adding all the letters onto the next generation. So we got like the S S19P, which I think stands for uh, powerful. I don't know. <laughs> there's there's actually my generation's s19 minor <laughs> that's an 18 year old guy from uh uh yugoslavia <laughs> that's it i tell you life's tough in the in the eastern block <laughs> there's an s that's the s19b because he's been in there for forever <laughs> anyway just being stupid so each of these miners has a lower and lower cost of, uh, of production. 
So I hope that helps you understand that. And actually, we used to have a guy on the site. I haven't talked to him in a while, and he's got a bunch of my money that uh, theoretically he's managing. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. I haven't talked to him in a while. Maybe he can reach out uh, on uh, on Twitter because I don't know whether he got the memo that we moved to Discord. He's probably still trying to talk to me on Rocket Chat. <clears throat> anyway, he was the one who actually wrote this script. Um, and uh, in essence, like if you actually go and look at the inputs, right, these are all sort of the uh, variables of uh, mining. So you can see there's the S17s. There's the S19s, right? and of course, this is all, uh, you know, what is your cost of production uh, for what's your cost of electricity, et cetera. Um, so, and I've had lots of people tell me, you know, my electricity cost is this, my electricity cost is that. So uh, you can even see this one's still set at six cents or 12 cents. I don't even know. So from what I understand, well, the rest of these, uh, they all, um, Oh, interesting. So if we take the S17 down to that cost, but then probably this variable is different. So 100, 310, and 6. And what do we got here? We got uh, 53, 210, and 6. So yeah, just changing this, um, changes things. And I'm not the best at this. I, you know, I, whoop, that even took it even lower. Um, the best thing to do is, uh, what we need to do is get Shane, uh, back on the call, um, on the daily brief and just explain, uh, his logic behind, uh, these costs of production. This is a script that you can get on TradingView. I don't know whether he's made it public or not. So, uh, just, you know, search Bitcoin COP. You might be able to find it. Uh, and then, of course, green boxes. This is the technical zone, right? This is what I call the reload zone, 61.8 to 78.6. Simon Dixon, uh, whenever I hear him talk, he always tells all his people, uh, if you ever see the cost of uh, Bitcoin uh, discounted 80% from its peak in price, just go and buy it. So if anything, that's the one reason why I actually think that we do actually have to go down and take out these lows is because we actually have not traded back 80% lower than these highs. So a little bit suspect here, uh, this move up. And what concerns me about this is that this was a pretty typical seasonal move. Um, usually what ends up happening in the venture capital space, you'll notice that... Um, 2022 uh, was a bit of a train wreck. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, every every four years or so, Bitcoin does a kind of a reversey and it actually peaks into the end of the year. And then it's got to take like a whole year to clean itself up. Like I said, usually the typical correction is about 18 months. Uh, but usually, and you know, you might, if we just look at some of the years gone by, you see here, this is a good example end of a wipeout end of the year, tax loss selling, beginning of a new year, what are we gonna do with the Bitcoin price? We can't really take it any lower. New venture capital money comes into the market and you get that nice powerful dead cat bounce rally right out of the calendar year end. I mean, it's here's another one. Out of the calendar year end, new money's coming into the market. What are we going to do? Let's take the market up. This happens to be a different part of the four-year cycle. I, uh, You know, here is uh, what I think. You know, you see you are here now because this is where I think we are. Same sort of idea. End of the year. New capital comes in. In this case, even into the end of 2016, people still made good money buying that sort of year-end January level even when the market dipped all the way in August of that particular year. So I don't know whether uh, these lows are going to hold. We never really did get the panic dump in Bitcoin price into the end of the year here, which was a little bit surprising. You notice that we actually dumped into November. And then actually we were very quiet and very orderly end of the year which concerns me a little bit, you know, 
I have I have yet to see the capitulation dump. It's the end of the world. Throw the baby out with the bathwater. Remember this one? Like I said, they actually had like the public through this event saying that they were willing to sacrifice their lives to save capitalism. Like, you got to be kidding me. What are you nuts? That's how stupid people get. That is the definition of capitulation, if I've ever heard it. Um, through this particular bottom, this was the Mike Hearn rage quit. And uh, this was quite a drama. Uh, and I actually remember when they chewed through all of these coins, that was basically the end of the uh, bear and the market just kind of went sideways for like six months. Uh, and then uh, that, that started the next big bull run. Uh, this bottom down in here, uh, this was the uh, Silk Road reversal. Uh, and actually, I was not in Bitcoin through this. I actually first started to pay attention to Bitcoin through, of course, this big honk and bull run here. So my experience uh, with these bottoms is there usually has to be some sort of panic, oh, the sky is falling kind of event uh, to actually mark a bottom, which leads is, like I said, we never did do the 80% correction. If we actually look at the cost of production, I think that the current equipment, even with our sort of inflated hyperinflation world, Still sitting at about eleven, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars for this sort of most up-to-date equipment. And the interesting thing about this, of course, is that after the next uh, halvening event, this number will jump to even now. If it stays where it is now, it will jump to twenty-two thousand. And if you don't think that'll happen, this is what happened with the cost of production after the last halvening event. Everything just jumps up and doubles. So I wouldn't be surprised if into this fall, you know, all about the U.S. congression and, you know, uh, the debt ceiling debate and is capitalism over and is the U.S. dollar toast, you know, and an absolute fr everybody freaking out. Um, we actually get a big dump. I, I actually think it could happen in the stock market as well. And I think you could see Bitcoin dump and take out these lows and trade due to that 80% correction number um, coming down the pike. So, you know, that's sort of what this conversation is right now. So, you know, that's sort of bigger, long-term, huge. But let's talk a little bit now about sort of what's happening in the short term. Uh, as I had said uh, there a minute ago, we had a very normal seasonal bottom uh, sell into tax loss selling uh, window. Very typical. Of course, we had, you know, uh, conveniently fueled uh, uh, panic events in that FTX. This was basically when FTX blew up. Kind of interesting. I, you know, I even heard someone recently say, well, FTX mysteriously found seven billion dollars i wouldn't even be surprised to be honest with you that that son of a bitch doesn't actually serve a day in jail right and his whole case because he bought all of these politicians you know they have to pay him back somehow mysteriously that whole case is just going to be swept under the carpet and a few years down the road you're going to hear of some presidential pardon here or some political buyout there. And it turns out the guy never does a, a single day in jail. Well, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But anyway, the point of the matter here is we we got the FUD to get you all to freak out. Uh, I think that the public, of course, did panic. You know, the public now, if you ask them about cryptocurrencies, there's only one thing that's on their mind. It's all a fraud, SPF, the whole damn thing. I think that we had a very normal, very healthy seasonal rally. Wall Street has done very, very well. Anytime Wall Street can bang out a double, you can see these lows. Keep in mind, you know, the institutions, who puts the bottom in the market? We all know it's the institutionals, not, it's not the public. So somebody had to be coming in and buying up all of these Bitcoins that the public was panic dumping, selling. 
And gee whiz, that's $15,000. And oh, mysteriously, look how we worked our way up to almost exactly double that price. Do you think that's an accident? I don't. So anybody who bought down here, they basically got a double off. I don't even think that this move up is actually even done. But we'll see how it goes. Um, Wall Street is happy here. Nothing's broken with Wall Street. Wall Street won. I think a lot of these sort of technical reasons why I thought the market could lift here I think a lot of them are still in place. Like this bullish moving average setup here, nothing's changed with that. Um, inverted head and shoulders, that has a price objective up there at 35. Nothing's changed with that. I don't see any reason why we can't go up top there. 52-week um, reload zones, I'd actually say that they're starting to move down. And actually, when I did the daily chart analysis, I did find it interesting that if we actually look at the daily price chart, you can see that the 52-week range, 50% levels, if we use last beginning of April, interesting how we're at 420. Didn't really get much of an event this year for 420. Uh, but interesting, if we use that 420 high from last year, we've actually hit 50% levels. Uh-oh. So that's a, a sort of WD GAN time-tested rule that markets should retrace at some point their 52-week 50% uh, levels. And I think you can actually make the argument that that's happened now. So you can't dangle that out as sort of like, oh, well, we still got to do the 50% rule. Uh, I think that's off the table. And if anything... Looking back at this, when I did my analysis uh, earlier this morning uh, to uh, to get ready for this show, that did jump out of me, and I was like, "Ooh, that that's not a good sign." Believe it or not, I actually think that what we're doing right now is you can see that high corresponds with that high, so that means that we really should see a pullback that high went all the way down to that low. So if you kind of think market symmetry, right? We go down, we go up, we go down. Ironically enough, it should do the exact opposite. We go up, we go down, we go up. So that means if we draw a horizontal line off of this level right in there, that's probably where your correction needs to go to. Oh, what a surprise, right? We go back to this chart. There's the inverted head and shoulders, right? That was like point number two. I still think that this inverted head and shoulders is nothing's changed here whatsoever. It's just business as usual. The problem is, of course, price got taken quite a bit away from there. It looks like all they're doing is they're just bringing price back down into what I would consider a reload zone. And so that yeah, market symmetry that I told you, that high there down to that low, that's basically that low right there. I think we easily could trade right back down. What is that number? Somebody write this down. 25,401. I think that's a perfectly realistic number for us to trade down to. In fact, when I put this chart together, I got a whole bunch of reasons actually to think that this market should come back down here. And really the whole uh, message I had over the past couple of weeks is, Man, this market's still pointing up until it isn't pointing up. Well, I can tell you right now, it's not pointing up now. So it says it's not pointing up, it's pointing down. We probably should think, okay, well, where the hell is this thing going to stop going down, right? And you can see uh, horizontal support and resistance, this three weeks of dojis, whatever the lowest low in here, if you think institutional fingerprint, then whatever the bar made the previous low, plus the pre previous bar, whatever made the low, plus the previous bar, I would say that's actually your institutional fingerprint. That the market pushed up here, they brought the market down, somebody stepped in and said, no more down, you go up, no more down, you go up, no more down, you go up. And eventually the market said, fine, all right, we'll go up. Uh, in fact, actually the market was about to break down and then you know who came out in social media and tried to jack the sort of the uh, space around, get them really thinking bearishly. 
And it turns out that was a trap and that was sort of your final leg before uh, probably his crew pushed this market up to new highs. Anyway, point of the matter here is uh, now that we've kind of rolled over and if we look at the lower time trend charts, you'll see it. Where should we find support? Well, definitely against those lows. Also, too, there is that inverted head and shoulder level. I think also, too, you can make an argument that 200 weekly moving average should be support. Also, too, the 13 EMA on the weeklies should be support. And then to final add sort of final insult to injury, there is 38.2, which I've, I even remember telling you guys recently when we looked at like other names uh, on our coinage shows that we're doing on Wednesdays. Hopefully we'll get our microphone fixed so you can actually hear me. But uh, man, I remember, and I constantly talk to you guys about this, that at any given point in time, you should expect 38.2s to be traded to at any given point in time. It's not, and you could even make the argument a move from up here down to 38.2. It could happen in like a heartbeat. And yet it's not a crash. This is actually just normal. This is the market relieving this one directional move here coming back to the 38.2. So that means I've got like literally five different reasons, horizontal support and resistance, head and shoulders breakout, 200 SMA, 13 EMA, and the 38.2 all saying that this area right around 25,000 is key support. Now, let's see if anybody can clue into what I'm thinking next. What would you call $25,000 in the real world? <laughs> I'm looking for four letters. Let's see if anybody can think of what the hell Brian is thinking here. Josh, where the hell is that Josh guy? He should know what I'm thinking here. And I've even given you the hints. Thank you, Zuki. Oh, Zuki. Zuki's in the in the uh, in the uh, hangout with me here. Or no, what Zoom call, right? That's right, Zuki. And actually, I have to. Anytime I ever. Oh, thank you, Joshua. One person. <laughs> Dmac, good. You're getting it. Does it not make sense? Does twenty five big ones? Does that not sound like a big fat round number? Hey, look at that. I went all blurry there. Did you see that, Chris? Big Brothers hijacked my camera. Well, I go, whoa, come on, camera. Wonder why that happened. Probably, was I waving my hands around? Hey, there. <laughs> Whenever I wave my hands around, uh, my camera goes, oh, oh I got to stop doing that. Anyway, you notice. You know what I have in my hair? And it's so funny. I've got this, uh, this hairdresser, and she's so cute. She's, uh, she must be a good 65 years old easily if she isn't a day older. She's from uh, I Iran. I think that's how I was supposed to pronounce it. And whenever I interact with sweet ladies like this, I, I, I try really hard not to insult them, right? And, you know, a lot of people in the West, they call Iran, Iran. And I think that actually pisses them off. <laughs> so anyway, she's, she's so adorable. But you know the big thing in Iran, what they use? They use beeswax in their hair. Did you know that? So that's what I have in my hair. That's why it looks so damn stylish right now. Beeswax. <laughs> Jason Newman says, I like big round numbers and I cannot lie. Ooh, I like that. I'll, I'll have to hijack that, that line. So should it really surprise us, BFRN, if we happen to come down and bang into a big fat round number here at 25 grand? It shouldn't surprise anybody. That should just be business as usual. All of you should go, yeah, that's pretty darn cliche. So we'll see what happens. My hunch is the initial pullback here is going to be into this cluster of support levels. What we do following that, I think it's too early to tell just yet. <laughs> like, of course, now you all know, uh, Brian's birthday is coming up here. 
So uh, send me a birthday card, wish me uh, uh, kisses, uh, all that kind of fun stuff. Once you get to my age, though, you don't even really like celebrating birthdays anymore. It's just another reminder of how old you're getting. So uh, if anything, just just take note that uh, Brian has found in his history that Bitcoin usually isn't very happy uh, through his birthday. <laughs> but what I actually posted on social media is in a weird sort of way, we might actually get a bit lucky here for the public. You know, if you can remember that Bitcoin doesn't usually really like to act very well through birthdays, if we actually go down to the daily chart, you know, there is uh, that 38.2 number we talked about. There's Brian's big fat round number, 25 Gs. Interesting how this recent dump, look how it was right into a fog and bomb level. Look how the market acted last fog and bombs, right? It just V-bottomed and then just took off. I don't know whether we can get that here because we are actually up at the top of this damn megaphone and we just can't lose this megaphone level. It's remarkable. I thought we were going to lose the megaphone and we were going to crank higher. And then all of a sudden, and what's interesting about this is we have to go down to the uh, four hour chart to see this. Is uh, this we had a, a bullish bot setup that actually fired through the Ides of March. And I get the impression that it was that Ides of March pivot that actually this whole market was working off of. It is interesting too, we had another bot come in uh, on the way up to that level, which painted this target up here. And if anything, this is the reason why you have these rules in the bot to sort of lock in profits. Because you notice as soon as we hit 66%, that's when we started waffling. And if you had done things like just simply said, look, and I'm gonna use market structure, if we get a big fat M that comes in here, once we're beyond this 66, then I better get the hell out. And it is actually interesting that on this M structure, you can see it looks like a bit of a head and shoulders top. The algo itself, we had the algo actually give out a buy signal here. And that was painful to buy. It was a, I was like, oh, this is crazy. Why the hell am I buying it? The algo just so happens to be one of the trading plans that I'm running uh, this particular year. So I have to do it. You have no choice. That is a trader's life. And like subconsciously, I knew this was a disaster. <laughs> sure enough, I had to take a 3.8% loss on uh, the trade because the algo flipped over bearish and I had to get out on this rally candle right here. But looking back in hindsight, well, I guess that was the right thing to do. You can see how much price has fallen since then. So I'm happy that we, we are sitting on the sidelines in the algo, just waiting for the algo to turn back bullish. And who knows when the hell that's going to happen. Uh, but it is interesting how we did bang up and hit this original Ides of March uh, bot target. Bang. Uh, this started to waffle out and started to M out. So if you were in this one, and maybe you just walked away and, you know, all hell started to break loose. Uh, it was also interesting, too, off of this little M on the breakdown, we tanked into 2.618. Then we tried to counter trend rally right back up. We failed and we started to really melt down. We went blowing right through 4.669s, but we came down to this 4.669 down in here. But we have this 2.618 off of this huge M that's still floating just below us here. As well, this original top, like I said, 2.618, we ran into that. 4.669, we got a little bit of traffic around that. So this 8.77 has not been traded to yet. So I've got 8.77, I've got 2.618 that are both sitting just below this level which leads me to believe that this is this level is very vulnerable down here. I'm a little bothered by this. I don't think this down move is done just yet. I think there was a nice little counter trend rally that came out of this low. Uh, it was also just off of the social media influencers uh, tail low. We say wicks and tails like to be eaten. We say that there were a bunch of trap bears in this tail that needed to be released. And I think that's exactly what this counter trend rally is, was them getting released uh, from really bad trades that they were stuck in. And this counter trend rally is nothing more than them buying those positions back. 
Uh, but I'm leery about what's going to happen here. I, you know, if I wanted to short Bitcoin, believe it or not, my trade level is all the way up here, right? Reload zones. You know how Brian is. Also, too, the predominant uh, prevailing trend line off of this market structure now is actually all the way up here. Also, too, the market likes of late to rally into FOMC meetings. So I'm a little concerned that we've dumped so hard here that actually we've gotten the market actually a bit oversold here in the short term. You also notice too that this is reload zones off of this particular range. Remember uh, social media influencers, they're sort of the, you know, the people that were shorting down here, they're gone now. You might even argue the market's actually a little bit imbalanced, probably too many sellers and not enough buyers. Also too, so I wouldn't be surprised if there are some shenanigans around this area, because I also noticed too that off of the entire range, 38.2s, just a little bit lower than where we are right now. Now, we could work our way up into FOMC and then dump really hard on the other side of it. That's sort of what I'm thinking which takes us down into these levels and these levels, uh, but that's following the Fed event. Here we are. It is uh, it is the 23rd Fed event is still a week and two or three days away. Between now and then, I wouldn't be surprised if you actually see that they work this market back up. Could they have a little FU against these lows to hit these foggy boggy levels? 88.6s, wicks and tails like to be eaten, candle body lows for trade location. Yeah, I actually think that they could. This market's that vulnerable. So I'm not overly bullish right now. If anything, I'm kind of like if we go back to that weekly chart, I'm kind of saying, you know, where is the key support in here? And I'd like to see these levels traded to before I actually start thinking that, all right, we've actually put in a bottom. It's time to go back up. You might also argue, too, if we, uh, you know, again, big fat round numbers, 25 Gs, that head and shoulders level. This is kind of a messy place in here. What I'm worried about, and I even saw on the site yesterday, people saying, all right, is this enough for trade location? Have I got enough reasons to justify going long? And I'm kind of like, oh, be careful. You know, if we actually look at momentum here, what letters of the alphabet do you guys see here? And don't bullshit yourself, people. I mean, just as plain as day. Do we see W's here in these indicators? I mean, come on. Let's let's just call a spade a spade. Oh, Jesus. Big House says Brian's birthday is May 11th. In numerology, he will be in a five-year cycle equals lots of changes. Really? Oh, Jesus. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. should, I, should I take Liam out on the road here right now, Big House? Is that a good idea? Or should I just say, you know what? I'm going to hunker down in my in my cave and just ride this out until we get beyond this goddamn birthday. Oh, goodness. Anyway, I don't know what's going to And also, too, I'm so irreverent, Dave, Big House. One of these days, Jerry's going to say, you know, or Winnie, who knows, maybe Vladdy, all of them in unison, substitute drama teachers. <laughs> They're going to say, enough of it, enough with this guy. Somebody take him out. <laughs> We've got a nice, Klaus has my uh, prison cell. He already has it already uh, uh, ready for me. And I think the, even the key to the actual cell is on his uh, keychain because he wants to keep that as a keepsake. And I'm going to teach that son of a bitch uh, calling me uh, a commie. <laughs> All right, back to our story. Sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, Joshua says positive changes, my guy. Isn't that interesting? I, how can you tell right now? I'm I'm sort of a ha glass is half empty kind of guy right now, eh? Uh, <laughs> I should be thinking, 
hey, I'm going to get a double D's in, that are going to enter my world. That's what I should be thinking, right? <laughs> hey, did that got to smile on Chris. Hopefully, I got Chris to smile. <laughs> Double E, screw it, man. Double H's. You ever seen that girl? I think her name is Faith online. Woo-wee. Double H's. She's out of the UK. Woo, man. That, that girl gets your attention. <laughs> All right. Enough, enough, enough is enough. <laughs> oh, hey, look at that. Five-year good for travel and sex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not that bad. I, I think I'm still an A cup. I, I haven't gotten that bad, Joshua. <laughs> Man, <now. laughs> but yeah, I even posted uh, somebody posted that way back image of us when we were in Portugal, I think it was. And I was like, oh my goodness, I got to go on a diet. <laughs> All right, uh, let's get back to the story. So, what letter of the alphabet is it that we want to see to justify us buying? And do we see that letter anywhere here? Now, if anything, I got to be a little. Oh, Jesus Christ. Look at that. Look at that. Looks, that does not look good. Oh, man. Uh, you can see over here, I was going, OBV drift is still up. Well, uh oh, folks. Uh, something just happened there in OBV. That's not a good sign. In fact, I seem to remember somebody saying, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Paul. Uh, but somebody made reference to Paul saying that he actually uh, pointed out an OBV divergence. I think it was like on the weekly chart or something. It's like, uh-oh, that's not good. Maybe this is what he was looking at. So uh, even on this most recent push up, it was not on new volume. So a little bit suspect here. Remember, this was uh, that uh, social media guy, uh, Cobain guy, who uh, kind of got everybody to think short. And then there was one more push up. I wouldn't even be surprised if this was like their exit liquidity pump that you often hear social media guys talking about, that they need to screw around with the sort of lower time frame participants, right? There was his event right there. It was that event right there. Actually, you know, you see it a hell of a lot better on, I think it's this four hour chart there, right there. Uh, and then notice following that event, they had this push up. And as we saw, OBV actually went into divergence there on the weekly chart. It topped out big fat M through here. And, you know, uh, you're just going to have to learn what the tells are. If anything, you can see on a weekly chart, Willie almost went stupid. That's not a good sign. Good to see. No divergences here on the weekly momentum indicators. That would have been bothersome. Got to be a little bit concerned about this MACD, though. That does not look good. So you can see there's a bear div coming in on the weekly MACD. So there to there, there to there. That's probably a sign uh, that this, uh, this rally that we've enjoyed, this very normal seasonal rally, I mean, beautiful W. You can see the bottom coming in through the fall. Nice big push up. Now that we're into the spring, all right, sell in May and walk away. Uh, you know how the cliche goes when it's around Brian's birthday, get ready for a pullback. So, you know, pull it all together. I don't think there's really a shock here. So, uh, you know, in the, in the near term, I do like the idea of them backfilling this into the FUMC. Once we're on the other side of that FUMC, uh-oh, I'm very concerned. And I, I showed you earlier, what I'm concerned about is try and remember that, you know, first off, what do these bottoms usually look like? They haven't looked like a V yet. So I don't understand why we would be thinking that they would look like a V this time. They usually look like a wide base. And what I usually tell people is that what we want to see for that base is what we call a saucer bottom. That would be normal. That would be healthy. So are we going through the process of making a saucer bottom? What does a saucer bottom look like? And I'll tell you, it usually looks something along these lines. And do yourself a favor and get to know Mr. Wyckoff. It's 
it's pretty cliche. And the irony of it all is that should we expect a bottom in the year 2023? Yes. So we're right on schedule. This is exactly what this is supposed to look like. Ah, right in that damn, there it is. This is, it's business as usual. I know, whether it be the money cycle. And actually it was interesting, this guy here, the, uh, the, the interviewer of this guy here says, well, what is it that you want to see uh, to uh, to mark a bottom. And ironically enough, he didn't even say anything about the price of Bitcoin or anything like that. He said, oh, it's all about the money cycles. So, you know, maybe it's worth your while getting to know that money cycle image that I uh, showed you earlier and uh, and what does a bottom in, in the cost of money actually look like. Anyway, so the point being, I, 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 like I said before, I believe this year, looks a heck of a lot like the 1216 uh, cycle bottom, which means that what we should really expect is something along the lines of this through this year, right? And then we go back to that Bitcoin image that I showed you, start off the conversation with, which looks something like this, which means, except you guys aren't going to like me for this, but it means to me that we probably have to do something like this, All right? That basing year. You never know what the hell these things look like in hindsight, or I guess in foresight, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if we're gonna do something along these lines. Okay, well, that actually works well, because I think I've based it. What do you think? Have I talked this thing into the ground? I think everybody gets a pretty good idea. I'm looking for a rally into the Fed. Once we're on the other side of the Fed, oh, be careful. <laughs> and, you know, in the near term, do we have any catalyst to shoot for? Yeah. I mean, we got a big fat round number that should make this actually really easy for you to understand uh 25 g's i think is kind of a no-brainer here how how long does it take to get there what does this look like uh making our way down into there and eh, it's tough to say you know like i said this is actually i think our trading range for the time being we could see a nice little fu against these lows in fact actually i think i put another chart out maybe it was uh it i think it's like a 30 minute i don't really like showing you these guys on uh, the trading view, or excuse me, on social media like YouTube, because 30 minute charts, nine times out of 10, the market's going to look completely different by the time I get back from Liam. So, you know, for, uh, talking to you off 30 minutes charts is kind of a waste of time. But nonetheless, I'll just simply say there is that 2.618 that I talked about just below all these lows. There is 38.2, just like we should expect 38.2 tests to the downside. We should expect 38.2 tests to the upside at any given point in time. And then just sort of really blow your mind here. What I think's happening here with this entire image is this is just one big ass fractal. So this is the left shoulder of the fractal. This is the head of the fractal. And I think we're going to make a right shoulder of the fractal right through the FUMC meeting. So we'll see how it goes. You can see these uh, triangles, which are kind of like fractals unto themselves, that set up this bigger fractal. I think we're going to do exactly the same thing here. So you can see there's the smaller uh, rectangle. I think we have you know a really wild gyration through the Fed. Probably looks something like that. And then we'll have to do another one of these uh, sort of, you know, you can see the rectangle over here, uh, over here on this side. And then once we're through this whole fractaling process, which it looks to me like you can't even see what date this is, but this is like well into May, probably the middle of May. Then I think we get our serious break lower. Because I think that that Gensler guy is going after CZ. I think that's going to be the catalyst that breaks this market in the short term when you actually hear 
that, you know, formal charges are being laid and arrest warrants are being issued and stuff. It doesn't necessarily mean that CZ is going to ever be arrested. I think he relocated to Hong Kong because he's going to use now China as sort of a, a security blanket. And I wouldn't even be surprised if he bribed some Chinese official to do so. But having said that, I wouldn't be surprised if Gessler going after crypto is actually the catalyst that breaks this massive fractal. And then we start going through this serious process of working our way back down into reload zones, eating this tail, coming back to 30 SMAs, and actually seriously testing this low. And ironically enough, I actually think, you know, I'm going to just leave this line on the chart. I think we're going to trade down to this line here. But I don't think that that comes until like September, October. This is going to be a wild ride uh, over the next six months. And then, as I said uh, to you, and I've said to you guys repeatedly, once we get to six months prior to the happening event, if you are a bull, you want to change your life for the better, you better have got all of your altcoins that you want to be invested in. I do like the idea of picking up new names as we come along. Uh, I pointed out at the 36 minute mark, this guy tells you exactly how you do it. So don't take Brian's words of advice. Just listen to this guy. I think he's pretty smart. I think he's a pretty heads up guy. And I think uh, you do pretty good. But the issue here, though, is you got to do it all in the context of a plan. And what I see most people do when they come into crypto and yeah, really investing. Remember, I was a broker, prop trader, the whole thing. They don't work with a plan. You got to have your plan. And that's the whole premise behind TRI's education program is we help you build that plan. Okay, <sighs> enough's enough. We'll answer whatever questions there are here in the last 20 minutes. And then uh, everybody can uh, think a little bit about positive thoughts uh, for Brian on the road with Liam here today and, uh, and uh, us having a very uh, non-eventful uh, drive in the countryside to uh, give Liam a totally awesome afternoon with lots of McDonald's hugs and uh, kisses, uh, uh, giggles, and uh, and just a, a nice positive day. Because that's really <laughs> that's my biggest worry in life is can I make my boy happy? <laughs> so all your positive thoughts in that regard, uh, much appreciated. Okay, uh, so Chris said somebody did ask a question. I have no idea if I can answer it or not, but I'll just try my best. So where the hell is that? I can have that over here, uh, over here. Nope, over here. I think it's over here. Hey, there we go. All right, so Brian asked. Brian, I just finished the level two and I'm still trying to put in 100 paper trades. Good, go slowly. I mean, hopefully, I don't know what number you're at now, but hopefully you're starting to see what the hell this, this, this life of a trader actually looks like. I'm on the US East Coast and I have a nine to six job, so I can't day trade. Okay, that's fine. Been trading crypto in the one hour time frame, and I want to trade futures and ETFs on the one hour as well. Okay, that's fine. Entering trades on weekday evenings. Uh, you know what? If anything, try and figure out if you can try and enter in through, especially if you're going to be doing the futures contracts, see if you can somehow um, hunt that New York kill zone. Right. So that's for me is about 530 to about 830 my time. So you on the East Coast, that would be about 8, 830 a.m. to 11, 1130 your time, somewhere in that window. I don't want to go to higher time frames because then it would take too long to get my paper trades in. I think of these as swing trades, so I'm not sure if I need to consider the Tokyo kill zone at 7 p.m. on the one hour time frame. What approach would you take in this situation to get experience in a variety of assets? Well, there's no reason why you can't uh, just, you know, and this is what I like to do if I'm uh, paper trading a new setup is I will just literally pick and it doesn't really matter. I'll pick anything, right? We'll do high grade copper. All right. So talk about just randomly picking markets. Then what I'll do, and you can't do it off the one exclamation mark, but I'll go like HG. Uh, obviously, uh, July copper is probably your uh, contract that you're going to be concentrating on right now, because, of course, you are a gnarly old futures trader. 
and then just hit the replay button, right? I'm on a four hour chart and let's go back in time. Let's go back to there and just start, right? And just simply say, all right, I'm on my uh, four hour chart. Uh, not quite sure what that is. Uh, oh yeah, that's ATR script. Um, do I want to keep that on there? Uh, actually, it's interesting that that's not on there. Maybe, well, let's see what we do here. There we go. All right. So I guess it needs a little bit of data to work with. But so something like that, starting at your four hour chart, uh, start to hunt and setups. So, you know, right now, uh, it, I've gone back a little bit. Obviously, this market's going to be a bit thin because it is a July contract. This is back in December, but you can start to see how I'm drawing all this out. Uh, reload zones. In fact, we'll do all of them. Uh, uh, boom. All right, so I've got my FIB levels. Interesting how uh, 371 and 38.2s. There's also a price cap. No reason why you can't denote that. What I like to do is let markets come into levels. All right, we've broken higher, so that means I can draw that up higher. Uh, and, you know, as things are working away, interesting how we're coming into an ATR script up top. You could have been doing things like I'm going to do a chaos theory uh, level. So if I see that level come in, uh, we'll go uh, chaos, boom. All right, 4669. Interesting. So we got a level. You notice the ATR script sitting up at that 4669. We could also do things like, um, say, extensions. Is this a 127? Is this a 1.618? Oh, look at that. 1.618, 1.45. Uh, long and short of it here coming into a level. All right, we can even put uh, 4669. All right, so you can see, I'm not quite sure if the script did that or if, uh, all right, so we keep moving up here. You can see how close we're getting to that 4669. Let's maybe slow things down a little bit. Okay, well, and then go, there we go. So now we've hit the 4669, we've hit 1.618. Can I now drill down to say like, um, I don't know, let's go down to, like you said, you're, I, I personally would prefer 30 minutes. That's just me. Can I start hunting for a trade setup at this level, right? We have our higher time frame level. Notice the market came straight down like a rocket. So can I, and remember, I just grabbed this market out of thin air. So it's really, you know, I have no, Agenda here, I am just practicing. So you can see exactly where I am allowed to uh, hunt trade setups right up against the top end of the range. That would be just slightly higher than that 4669. And then you just let the thing work. Now, if we move down lower, then you know that we have to adjust, which we did, right? And so you can see, I'm just going about running my business of trading. I'm back testing in a way. I mean, we'll use the back testing, but I'm doing it in the replay mode. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but you can see how I'm just working away here. Um, I'm on the 30 minute. You know, you might even say that I can take a trade at this level. And when we get down to this level, if we do get into here, then I'll drill down to like the three minute. And obviously you can tell I've got to move. I keep adjusting. You can see how reload zones shift. All right, so you can even see we're starting to come into levels. So you can see how I'm just hunting away here. Right? You might even make an argument that, all right, well, this kind of makes sense because now we can go A to B and uh, C to D. And now you can see the market's starting to set up a level here. So we will just work it. Now, if you're practicing and you're like, okay, I want a paper trade, I think what happened was that must have been a day session uh, reset. So that's why ATR did that. Uh, are you going to shift ATR? Come on. All right. There. Oh, all right. So you, now you can see we've gotten into reload zones. You can see where my ABCD is. 
now, you know, what? what's pick your poison? Are you just a levels guy? Like if I'm not mistaken, hey, look, there's a price cap. You did the level two course. So we can make the argument that you've got 78.6. You've got a gap fill. Basically, this is the institutional fingerprint right here. So is that a level to justify hunting a short off of? Right, that's the institutional fingerprint. So this, they are the institutions. If this is a top, they're going to defend that level like a son of a gun. Have I got a level that maybe I should uh, think about strapping on a short off of? Well, we're starting to come into some interesting areas. So, you know, at this point in your education, what you really want to be doing is pulling up your charts. Do I have Willie Stupid? Oh, I do. Now, do I have a confirmed bear momentum divergence? I do have a potential divergence. Hopefully you can see how this is playing out, right? Boobity boo. So if I got any kind of smaller div that came in and confirmed up here, rock and roll. So hopefully you can see, do you see how I did this? Now, I don't know whether I really want to, maybe I just want to leave the lecture at that and you tell me what happened here. How many shorts did it take to actually get a trade off here? I don't even know what happens next. But let's just hypotheticalize, if that is a word, we're going to hit the midpoint of this reload zone, just for fun. Okay? And this might be one of your day trades. So you can see how you're doing this after hours. I have no idea what's going to happen here. I, I just don't know. You know, we're going to try and sell two contracts. At minimum, I'd like to sell three. But let, let's see if we can sell two contracts. So then that way... Uh, we'll take profits at two to one on one of the contracts. And if that thing does fire and we do get filled here, we might, if we're really lucky, have grabbed the M top. And if this is an M top and that actually becomes a sell signal and this is the top and I'm short from here, then I might at that point start drawing things like fog and bombs going the other direction. And I might look to uh, where we're we going here. We'll go chaos. I might look to take profits on the next contract because remember I sold two, you know, maybe they're micros, I don't know, uh, there. And then we'll look to take the second one off at 5.6 to one. You never know. Now, I don't know whether this trade's going to work or not. I haven't got a clue, but this is a trader's life. Let's see what happens. My hunch is I'm going to get stopped out. And then we have to remember Linda Bradford Ratchke, she would say, all right, well, if you get stopped out on your first attempt, just keep focused because maybe the second attempt works. I don't know. All right, so you can see we're working away. We're in the money. Things are looking good. All right, well, that's not so bad. Oh, hum, oh, hum. I usually, for whatever it's worth, as a day trader, I usually like to draw out 50% of my anticipated move. Remember, we got filled up here, right? Uh, so 50% of that. Uh, let's do it. So there, there. At 50%, I like to move my stop to scratch. And then that way, you know, it's very debilitating if you're sitting in a winning trade to actually go and take a full loss. It's like, oh, man. So I like to give myself permission at 50% of the anticipated move. Then I'm just going to simply move my stop to scratch. So you can see at this point, it's okay if this thing does come back and it hits there. I'll just walk away at scratch. I haven't got a clue what's going to happen here. And it's coming back down, coming back down, going up, going up, going down, going up, going down, going up. Hopefully you see this is a trader's life. Get used to it. <laughs> this is just, this is your life. So, I, I mean, we could spend all day here. I don't, I have no idea what's going to happen. But hopefully you can see this. And, you know, I just did this. I grabbed a market randomly. We went through the whole process. And now you can see I'm just sitting here in a trade and I don't know whether I'm going to make any money or not, but I've got all of the levels all laid out and I just got to live with the results. I won't take a loss on this thing if it comes back. It's just you, anybody can do this at any given point in time, any market, anywhere. And like I said, I have no idea what's going to happen. here. Does anybody know? I'm sure you probably fast forward it. <laughs> well, now look at that. We've gone right off the mark. Oh, it looks like I'm going to get stopped this crap. 
And no, I forgot to stop. Yeah, look at this. Are they going to break this thing out? Look at that. Talk about a torture test, eh? <laughs> so what a great analogy of a trader's life. Perfect analogy. Absolutely perfect. So uh, let's go over here. There is our two to one. Merry Christmas. Let's see if you guys can remember how this goes. Where should my stop be on the second contract now? We'll just leave that open. Where should my stop be? I've already been filled on one contract now. I got my two to one, right? So if we go back there, right, you can see this was two to one. So I've got my first fill. I'm done. Where should my stop be on the second trade? Should still be at break even. Remember we said at 50% of your trade, your stop should be at scratch. In this particular case, I am now a profitable trader. Look at me. And then now the question is, am I going to be able to go out and buy a whole bunch of hookers and blow tonight with my trading? I might. I have a feeling that I'm going to get stopped at scratch on the remaining. You always should think sort of conservatively. But if we trade down to 2.618, then it means hookers and blow are on me. Let's see what happens. Do, 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 do. Oh, look at that. It's flirting. Come on, hookers and blow. 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 Ah, boo. Come on. I want my hookers and blow. Uh, how long do I have to sit in here? I gotta say, I gotta lose my cocaine addiction by the time this damn trade's gonna work. <laughs> well, that's a good sign. Now you can see ATR has shifted down to my target. That's a great sign. Still in there. Oh, look at this. This is looking good. Hookers and blow. Hookers and blow. Hookers and blow. Come on, hookers and blow. Anyway, hopefully you see th this is basically a trader's life. Yeah, we had no idea what was going to happen here. Didn't pre-program this. We hunted our setup. We've put on our contracts where we were supposed to put them on. And now it's just a question of, do I skip double Ds tonight? Maybe double Es? Maybe double Hs? Come on, baby. Come on. Come on. Oh, double. Come on, you're killing me. <laughs> now, I will say, at this point, with me being such up such a huge amount on this trade, I might give myself permission to take profits on that W because technically when that W does come in, now we can do fog and bombs going the other direction. And my hunch is 2.618 is probably going to take us right back to the scratch. <laughs> and let's see what we got here. Survey says, oh, oh okay, so 2.6. This would be like a full bifurcation pullback. So why don't we call it at that? We took profits here. You can see market came back down to that level. We got four to one risk reward on our second contract. So first contract, we got off at two to one. Second contract off at four to one. Do you see how anybody can practice this any given point in time? It's not rocket science. You just have to know what to look for. And I had no way of knowing what was going to happen here. If anything, that should probably actually make a pretty good short if you can put that together, Chris. I don't know whether you can or not, but that's that's exactly what I'm trying to teach you guys. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, it wasn't cool. Man. That was pretty awesome, man. Hey, I'm try to, too bad. What's that? I was saying I'm going to try to clip it so that we can hear you chanting again, hookers and blow, hookers and blow. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't get it. Well, you know what? We got a we got a hooker with B cups. That's not so bad. <laughs> I'll take the B cups. <laughs> All right. On that note, if you want to learn how to do this for yourself, if anything, this is great advertising. That Josh guy should absolutely love this. You know, school term starts in about two weeks. This this is what we teach. I I tell you, I've changed a lot of people's lives. I mean, a lot of people's lives. Uh, it's it's straightforward. It's not rocket science. I tell you though that this is the absolute hardest job to make easy money in the world. 
Yeah. You saw that just are just going through this. I had no idea what was going to happen here. And I told you two or three times as we were going through this that I expected to get stopped out because you just don't know. So it's it's a very, very difficult way to make easy money in this world. But having said that, if you can learn the concepts that we're trying to teach you, this whole idea of, you know, I, I personally love that four hour hunt trade location. Then once you're in that four hour trade location, then you start drilling down and hunting the setups that we teach you, things like reload zones, institutional fingerprints, price gaps, horizontal support and resistance, moving averages, volume profile, harmonics. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And it's our great privilege to be able to teach you all of this. And try and remember, folks, and this is super, super important. I'm not here to tell you how to trade. I don't actually think that there is one right way to do this and everything else is wrong. My job is to just simply show you all the different ways that you can frame your behavior. We all know how many reasons should we have to justify acting in the marketplace? Should those reasons be all of the same? Is it a good idea to use RSI, MACD, and stochastic as my three reasons to justify taking a trade? The answer is an unequivocal no, because actually those are all the same reason, price momentum. But it's my privilege to teach you this, people. Nobody else in the world does this. Nobody teaches you how to do this. It's my privilege to teach you how to build and then run your small business of trading, including doing things like, oh God, this son of a gun wants me to do a hundred paper trades. Yes, because I want you to succeed at this. <laughs> so here's your sales pitch. Hop on this page and join the raffle, right? Enter the raffle and you might just win this for free. I mean, wouldn't that be awesome? If you need some help in understanding what the value proposition is here, don't listen to the beamish. Although, you know, I saw one guy the other day, it was just beautiful. He goes, I'm not bullish. I'm not bearish. I'm beamish. <laughs> <laughs> which is just i mean is that not the perfect testament i mean i could die now that's so perfect i can finally be with you jojo your investment in me paid off because we've made a positive difference in this world and if anything it would almost be better that i die now because then i be then i can become a martyr if i die now you guys are all responsible you've got to look after liam for god's sakes but it would be okay for me to die now because all of these videos would become sort of like crystallized in, in the ether. And the banksters can't, you know, sort of destroy me and, and publicly humiliate me and maybe even, you know, lock me in a, a jail cell or something and you all forget about me. I could become immortalized. So if anything... It might actually be better that maybe I become a martyr now. And then that way you guys all look back on me and go, man, that guy was, he was the shit. You remember that video where he walked through, he just randomly grabbed a commodity market and showed us how to day trade just totally randomly, you know, like that, that would make this historic, you know? So anyway, the only problem is, is, I worry about Liam immensely and he needs me. So because he needs me and I, I'm the only advocate for him in this whole world, I, I don't have permission to go. So anyway, God bless. Help me help you. That's what this is all about. 
help me help you. I want to change your life. But I can't do it unless, unless number one, you work like a son of a gun and watch all of these videos independently. And, you know, there's enough free content out there. You can do this. Or number two, which I think is actually a far less painful route, pay me this almost laughable sum here and let me teach you how to do this. And let me introduce you to this wonderful community of all these people that want to help you succeed, like Shark Toshi, like the Griminator, like Zach, like Chris, like Zugi, like Cypher. All of these people, they're such good people. And I love being around them. Um, and you know, it's because people like you who are listening to this have had faith in me that have paid me this relatively, you know, I'm gonna say it's it's not an it's not a nothing sum, but because you people have, I think it's a win-win relationship. We all come out in the end, and I can help people like Chris, you know, actually continue working away in this field while he's learning to get his shit together. And actually he and I have a very big date with the market this coming week, don't we, sir? So, but he wouldn't have gone there without at least a good few years worth of work. But, you know, whether it be Julian, uh, Sjord, uh, Grim, Shartoshi, Peter, uh, Marat, <laughs> Marat, that's a relative rotation guru now. Zach, Josie. Uh, I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. These are the people that 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 I've worked with over the years that have helped me. Kevin. I remember there's this crazy guy, Thomas, years ago that was around the site. Uh, Alex Renberg, Mr. Habsburg. <laughs> All you people, thank you very much for being in my life. Um, PMA for the win. Let's try and seriously make this world a better place for everybody. Uh, slow and steady wins the race. You can do this. You've got to get your shit together here, people. Seriously. Right? This is the window. Yeah, the mayor of Vienna. <laughs> I miss the mayor of Vienna. Hey, mayor, if you are uh, out there and you do happen to watch this, uh, throw me a hi. I miss you terribly, buddy. All right, everybody. Wish me luck on the road with Lily. Hope you got some value out of all that today. Um, slow and steady wins a race. Don't take no wooden nickels. Remember what your number one job is. Maybe consider joining our uh, education program. And uh, also, too, on Wednesdays, we're working with the Coinage people now. Uh, so uh, maybe tune in on Wednesdays and uh, you'll get a, a, nice, uh, a, nice introduce and a nice introduction to them. As I'm sort of teaching them how to uh, how to uh, um, trade, <laughs> all new generation of coinage years. All right, everybody, have yourselves a great day. PMA for the win. All the best. The only thing left for Brian to say: big kiss. But bye for now.